Good morning and welcome to Cross Lanes United Methodist Church as we celebrate the breaking of a new morning in the glorious victory of Jesus Christ who conquered death after being crucified and descending to the dead. This morning we remember that death was not the end of the story. This is the day Jesus' purpose was fully revealed. This is the day the disciples ran with fear and joy to tell the gospel story. This is the day Jesus promised to be with us, no matter what, to the end of the age. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You're going to hear me say throughout the service, Christ is risen, and I hope wherever you are watching today and participating with us in this service, you will respond, He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This morning, as we begin, we're going to enter into a time of confession. Let us pray. Holy God, we have ached for good news. After living a year of Lent, it became our habit, austerity, isolation, fasting from touch and company. We have died many deaths and perhaps have convinced ourselves along the way that it is the inevitable end. We have turned from life in order to protect ourselves from loss. And now we must retrain our hearts to trust in joy, to turn toward the sun, to hope. Through the resurrection of your son, O oh God, you destroy the power of death and remove your people's shame. Now, by the power of the Spirit, raise us from sin and seat us at the Paschal Feast, that we may rejoice in the gift of salvation Jesus has won for us. Let us say together, Help us, healer. Show us our strength. Forgive our inertia. Move us to move one step at a time toward greater care. Amen. In our tradition, confessions are followed by an assurance of pardon to remind us that we are broken, but we are not alone. After facing our sin and confessing it to God and to one another, we cannot be the same as we were before, and yet we can be whole, beautiful, purposed. Today, know this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and he bids you rise no matter what. Broken pieces have been made into a new whole. Scattered pieces tell a new story. Jesus goes before us for you, for me, for all, to prepare the way that leads to life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Every week, we set aside time in our service for our youngest disciples, a time to think and pray about scripture in a way that's meant specifically for their age and development. If you have kiddos in your house, please make sure that they know this is a time just for them. 
Hello, friends. You know, for the last six weeks, we were in the church season called Lent, a 40-day period in which we slow down in a special way to think and pray about what we can do to love God and neighbor. Lent is over this morning. It's Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and it's the beginning of the Easter season. The Easter season is a time we remember that there is nothing which can separate us from God's love. In the church, Easter doesn't just last one day, it lasts 50 days. In fact, we call it the Great 50 Days. And during this time, we read stories together in the Bible about all the things that people thought were impossible that God makes possible. In today's story, Jesus does something kind of impossible. Because he and God are closely connected, Jesus is able to live even though it looked like he wasn't going to. God is full of wonderful surprises like that. Do you like surprises? Me too. Some surprises are small. Maybe your mom puts a Hershey kiss in your lunchbox or your teacher decides not to give you homework. Those are good surprises. Other surprises are a little bit bigger. For instance, when I was about 10, my parents surprised me when they gave me two new siblings, twin sisters. It was a wonderful surprise and it changed my whole life. After they were born, I felt really important because I had a big job as a big sister. Me and my brother were really close in age, but my little sisters, they were like baby dolls to us. They were a happy surprise. Have you ever had a happy surprise that changed your life? Thank you for sharing. And and it's okay if you can't think of one right now. The thing about surprises are we can't guess when they're coming. We can't guess when surprises are coming. But in the church, we try to train ourselves to be ready for a surprise to pop up at any time. We want to be ready for the good surprises God might place in our lives. We don't want to miss them. We want to recognize them when they come. And that's part of the reason we get together every Sunday. When we get together, we practice being surprised. One of the ways we do that is by singing and shouting our praises to God. If you remember way back at the beginning of Lent, we buried alleluias to make some quiet time to pray. But this morning, at the beginning of the great 50 days, Easter, We don't want the Alleluias to be buried anymore. We want to raise the Alleluias to practice being surprised by God. This morning, if you hid an Alleluia in your house, feel free to pause this video and go and find it now and then join me back here. If you didn't hide an Alleluia, that's okay. You can help me find the ones I hid in the sanctuary. Do you see the Alleluia in this picture? It looks like a bright butterfly. What about in this picture? Here? What about in this picture? Great job. Thank you for helping me raise the Alleluia's. Alleluia is a word that means praise the Lord. This morning, as we remember Jesus and all the impossible things he made possible, as we practice being surprised by God, I want you to repeat after me. First, we're going to take our Alleluia's and say it loud. Alleluia! Can you try that? Alleluia! Okay, now one more time, this time as loud as you can. Alleluia! Okay, we're going to do it one more time. This time I want you to whisper as quiet as you can. Alleluia! 
very good. This week, I want you to look for ways God might be surprising you. It might be that you see flowers popping up from the ground after a long winter. Or maybe something you thought would never happen does. This morning, we're going to end our time together by praying and thanking the God who loves us no matter what, who surprises us with his goodness. Here at Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, when we pray, we start by our having our hands far apart and then clapping them together, and then you can repeat after me. Dear God, Alleluia! Thank you for loving us. Help us see all the good surprises you have given to us. Amen. It was good to be with you today, friends. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 20. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and came and rolled the stone from the door, and sat upon it. His continuance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of them, the keepers did not shake and became as dead men. And the angels answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly, and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, 
and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city, and shewed unto the chief priests in all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders, and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night, and stole him away while we slept. And if they come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they take the money and did as they were taught. And this is this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee and into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Over the course of Lent, our resident artist, Evelyn Clocky, created this mosaic vase. I called her weeks before Lent began and said something like, uh, what can we do with a bunch of broken pieces of glass that might show people what broken pieces are capable of becoming? I had an idea in my head after an exhausting year uh, after coming off of one of the most exhausting Advent and Christmas seasons of my own career, I wanted to acknowledge that as a congregation here at Cross Lanes United Methodist Church, we were, we are so broken. We are broken because we have experienced a lot of trauma and loss and controversy. But we are also broken because we are people who do what we do not want to do as Paul puts it. So I wanted to acknowledge our brokenness while also retaining the faith that God can make beautiful what is broken, that we are broken but not alone. It is in our brokenness that God meets God's people, that God digs them up out of the grave and gives them new life over and over and over again. In a recent prayer written by theologian and writer and pastor Nadia Bowles-Weber, she wrote that ours is a God of somehow. That's what I wanted to capture. That somehow, despite our best efforts to lie in ruin, God draws us toward life. That was the only vague, poetic, preachery direction I gave to Evelyn. And she made this. <laughs> It's beautiful, isn't it? Seven weeks ago, these were disconnected pieces of glass. So tiny and alone, they really had no use. They were sharp, rough to grab in a bunch. They were without story, a void. Um, they had no place to display their potential. And somehow with time and art and prayer and the Spirit's inspiration, these pieces are different than they were before. Somehow, in being connected to all the other broken pieces, they were given purpose. They are beautiful vessels which hold another beautiful vessel. Together, these pieces tell a story. Somehow, what they were capable of all along is now evident to the world. Thank you, Evelyn, for this holy gift. Looking at it makes me think about our phone call. 
there in those days before Lent. In this finished piece, you have reminded us indeed of what God can do with broken pieces. With a bunch of broken pieces, God can do the impossible, transform the world. The Easter story is full of brokenness. The women, the guards, the disciples, they all express their own version of brokenness in the daybreak hours of Resurrection Sunday. The women had come to see the tombs, uh, the tomb, excuse me. The guards were being bribed to cover the truth for the sake of Rome. The disciples were collecting themselves back at the upper room. Even Jesus, when he is referred to by the angels who roll away the stone, he's called the crucified. In the original Greek, in the participle, crucified is in the perfect tense, indicating that it is an event that has already happened, but also has an ongoing, lasting effect well into the future. Jesus is permanently the crucified one in this story, even while he is also the risen one. Even resurrected, brokenness becomes part of Jesus' DNA. The miracle of Easter is, because Jesus has taken on that brokenness himself, he is able to gather all the other broken pieces back up. He recognizes what it looks like to be shattered. He knows intimately what it feels like to be fragmented. And he is determined not to leave humanity that way. The women, the guards, the disciples, they won't be the same as they were before. But they could be beautiful, whole, purposed. It is interesting to note, I think, that we don't hear a whole lot of logistics about the resurrection it, event itself. Though it is the climax of the Christian story, the fulfillment of God's saving promises to Israel, the marker of a more inclusive grace than God had ever expressed before, we don't hear much about it. It has already happened by the time humanity clues in. What we read in scripture is an account of what happens as a result of the resurrection. Instead of Resurrection Sunday, we might aptly call this Sunday the what happens next Sunday. First, Jesus goes to the women. If we follow the scripture here, after experiencing an earthquake large enough to roll a stone away too big for the women to move alone, angels appear to them. They are told not to fear the one they came to visit uh, dead is alive, and the angel urges them to go on to the disciples and then to Galilee. They're to tell the disciples to meet Jesus in Galilee. But the women don't have to wait, actually. No more are the words out of the angel's mouth than Jesus appears to the women right there. They're running as fast as they can to tell the disciples who have been hiding uh, to meet Jesus when he greets them, and they recognize him immediately. They fall to their knees and worship him, grabbing his feet and singing his praises. Jesus repeats the angel's message, go and tell my disciples. He doesn't want the women to dwell at the tomb, to set up vigil, to stay where the burial cloth and the angels are. Apparently what comes next for them will be so miraculous on its own, they don't need proof, the proof that they leave back at the tomb. What comes next is what Jesus is interested in. The grieving women, the women who weren't invited to wherever the disciples are, the women who stayed uh, to the end are then the first to be commissioned with the good news the first to worship a risen Christ. Whatever they were before, they have a new beauty now, a new wholeness, a new purpose. What comes next makes them bearers of good news, the center of the community about to be built. Then Jesus disappears. And we read that the guards who had been frozen in fear at the sight of the angels have run into the city proper to tell the chief priests. 
They weren't commissioned, but it turns out, despite themselves, the guards also become bearers of good news. In trying to squash the story of Jesus' resurrection, they perpetuate it. In order to cover up their failure to keep Jesus in the grave, they have to tell everyone he isn't there. The guards who tortured Jesus, who served a selfish state, who took orders they should have refused, are given the same miracle as the children of Israel. God's grace. Even in their brokenness, in their blindness, they have been given a new beauty, a new wholeness, a new purpose. Jesus only needed to exist and be who he was to permeate even the Roman ranks. What comes next for the guards is a choice they never imagined having. They can decide to do what they have been bribed to do, to say that the disciples stole Jesus' body, or they can admit that something happened which they cannot explain. What comes next for them opens possibilities, whether they take them or not. We don't read of it in scripture, but the women must have made it to the disciples because the text jumps from the guards to the disciples already on the road to Galilee, some 80 miles away from Jerusalem. They see Jesus probably from miles away if he's on top of a mountain. They begin maybe to worship him from far off and they continue to sing and, and shout and rejoice as they get closer and closer When they get there, some of them are sure the person they are looking at is Jesus and that everything he promised them will come to fruition. The the meek will inherit the earth. The captives will be set free. The poor will receive good news. But some of them doubted that this was the same Jesus who had left them on Friday. To the shore and the doubtful alike, Jesus gives a final command. I've received all authority in heaven and earth, he says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey my commandments. And remember, I will be with you to the end of the age. The disciples who accused Jesus of sleeping while they died in a storm, who couldn't stay awake while Jesus prayed, the disciples who were shamed by their fear and their absence in Jesus' final hours, the disciples who were closest to Jesus and still failed him in the end, they're given new beauty new wholeness, new purpose. Jesus didn't want their confessions. He didn't want them to offer sacrifice. He wasn't interested in counting their sins. Whatever they were before, they can't be again. What comes next for them will equip them to transform the world What comes next is preaching and teaching, even though they don't have it all figured out. A tradition which they hand down and hand down and hand down. As soon as Jesus hops out of the grave in this scripture, he gathers all the people up to remind them that brokenness is no excuse in God's kingdom. They have work to do. Those who call themselves Christ followers should not fear. They should not hesitate. They should not linger at memorials or shy away from miracles. They should not worry that their doubt disqualifies them from God's work. Indeed, it makes them equipped. Easter is always a sign of life in the church. We deck out our spaces with color, right? We dress up. We hold extra services. We we tell the old, old story, and that is so important to who we are. Yet perhaps what is more important is what 
comes next. How will the utter miracle of the holy somehow take hold of our lives? What impossible thing will God do with all our brokenness? These are Easter questions. And they're questions at the top of my mind because on April 25th, we will hold indoor, in-person worship. It will be the first Sunday of many Sundays in an incremental relaunch plan. Details will be coming out about how we will gather and what our time on that morning looks like. But I have high hopes that whatever we were before, we will have a new beauty now, a new wholeness, a new purpose. Certainly much of what we do will look familiar. We will gather, we will pray, we will seek God's wisdom together. But I invite you in the time between now and then to be in discernment with me, to pray with me that we will be prepared to receive Jesus in the surprising ways he might appear to us after Resurrection Sunday comes and goes. May God bless us for what is next. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed and will be with us to the end of the age. Amen. This morning, as we continue to meditate on this word from Matthew, I invite you to visit crosslanesumc.org to find ways to respond to the word of God with your service, your witness, and your financial gifts. On the site, you will find instructions under the giving tab for ways to give your financial gifts through mail, text to give, e-check debit, or credit cards. To contact church leadership about upcoming opportunities to put your faith into action, you can email crosslanesumc at gmail.com. As we end our time together, we're going to hear a final song. This is a gift from the United Methodist Church all over the world, reminding us that we are not alone. We aren't just having church on our couch today or wherever it is that we might be. We join in joy with Christians all over the world for the God who puts broken pieces back together, giving fragments new purpose and new power. We may be scattered, but we are not alone. We are connected because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
sisters and brothers, we've heard the good news of the gospel. Now go with confidence that God is at work in the world. May the words of Jesus ring in your ears. Do not be afraid. I am with you always to the end of the age. May the Spirit move you, whatever comes next. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.